Futurized goes beneath the trends, tracking the underlying forces of disruption in tech, policy, business models, social dynamics, and the environment. Join me, futurist Trun Arne Unheim, PhD author, investor, and serial entrepreneur, as I discuss the societal impact of deep tech such as AI, blockchain, IoT, nanotech, quantum, robotics, and synthetic biology, and tackle topics such as entrepreneurship trends for the future of work. I'm a research scholar in global systemic risk, innovation, and policy at Stanford University. On Futurized, I interview smart people with a soul, founders, authors, executives, and other thought leaders, or even the occasional celebrity. Futurized is a bi-weekly show preparing you to think about how to deal with the next decade's disruption so you can succeed and thrive no matter what happens. Futurized, conversations that matter. If you're new to the show, seek particular topics or are looking for a great way to tell your friends about the show, we've got the episode categories. Those are at futurized.org slash episodes. I am the co-author of Augmented Lean, a human-centric framework for managing frontline operation and the author of Health Tech Rebooting Society Software, Hardware and mindset future tech how to capture value from disruptive industry trends pandemic aftermath how coronavirus changes global society the disruption games how to thrive on serial failure and of leadership from below how the internet generation redefines the workplace for an overview you can go to trondenheim.com slash books at this stage futurize is lucky enough to have several sponsors and to check them out go to futurized.org slash sponsors. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast or to get an overview of other services provided by me, including how to book me for keynote speeches, please go to futurized.org slash store. We'll consider all brands that have demonstrably positive contributions to the future. Before you do anything else, make sure you are subscribed to our newsletter on futurized.org where you can find hundreds of episodes of conversations that matter to the future. Please also leave a positive review on iTunes. Thanks so much. Daniel, welcome. Hey, Trond. <laughs> Great to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really cool to to be back and, and talking with you. You know, we've known each other for a good while. We um, had this uh, MIT event when you were at the very, very beginning of uh, starting Mass Robotics. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, you know, successful... Uh, company owner, you've done a lot of things, but also robotics has has moved into a new stage. I just want to introduce the audience very quickly to you, and then we'll we'll jump right into this idea of uh, robotics and AI and what's uh, hype and what's facts and what's coming. But um, yeah, so you're the chairman of Vecna Robotics, right? And uh, you are now consulting mostly in robotics. I think you you have stepped down from like active duty in Vecna. We'll talk a, a little bit about Vecna, super interesting kind of uh, industrial ro robotics company. And uh, But you've been uh, actively engaged in mass robotics, which is this Massachusetts network and uh, accelerator and so many things. So we'll, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll go through that as well. And I saw this very early beginnings of it. So super yeah. exciting now. A lot of exciting things going on. It's a really great time. Yeah. Maybe you can just give people a very quick sense of how you become or how you became an expert on robotics and what drew, drew you to robotics. I think that might be interesting for people. You know, Trond, I have a um, unique history that at the time I didn't appreciate. I actually grew up in what is now Silicon Valley. It wasn't Silicon Valley back then. It was mostly cornfields. And, you know, I used to ride my 10 speed around um, uh, the Valley and intentionally try and get myself lost. And, you know, this was just something I did, but these tech parks started popping up everywhere. And, um, it was a really exciting time because this idea of a computer was, you know, a computer that anyone could own was this brand new concept. Um, and, uh, you know, we had things like the Timex Sinclair 1000, um, uh, and then of course, uh, Commodore Pet and Apple One and all these things. And um, I uh, actually attended what was probably one of the world's first elementary schools that had a computer lab. Um, and I just, I just thought that, you know, this was an experience that everybody was having around the world. And no, it was actually incredibly unique to me. And I got um, access to things that, uh, you know, as, as a young person that were just absolutely revolutionary. 
Um, I had a lot of fun, actually. I used to dumpster dive in, in the Atari dumpster. Atari used to, of course, had a QA process, quality assurance, and they would throw away any cartridges, any game cartridges that didn't pass uh, a QA. And I got a lot of really... Actually, hold on one second. I apologize. No problem. Sorry, I apologize for that. No, no, the Atari dumpster. That's a that's a cool story. So you were picking uh, picking up uh, old uh, cards from the Atari dumpster. Yeah, so I I uh, used to, you know, wasn't entirely legal. I guess I had to jump a fence and uh, uh, go in and, um, scavenge from the dumpster at Atari, but, uh, I, I would get all these great, uh, game cartridges that, uh, you know, they just had a glitch. Usually it was just like a graphical glitch or something, but they still worked fine. So it was kind of a magical time. I, uh, went to swap meets and bought all the parts I needed to build a, uh, build an Apple, Apple II plus actually, um, from, uh, you know, just parts that I, I, uh, was able to pull together. But, um, you know, I, I just grew up uh, um, programming, building robots, building uh, computers. I got a uh, Armatron from Radio Shack, and I replaced all of the mechanical parts and put stepper motors in there and, you know, interfaced it with my computer. So it was just, it was just this fascinating time of, um, uh, you know, sort of new, new possibilities that hadn't really existed before. Um, and, uh, you know, I eventually found myself, uh, um, uh, in, in a lot of really exciting, um, places. I was chosen as the, uh, top computer science student out of all, uh, California high schools. And I was able to go to Lawrence Livermore national lab and work on artificial intelligence, which, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about today, artificial intelligence algorithms on the then fastest computer in the world, which was a, a Cray supercomputer. It was called Bubbles uh, because the entire computer was submerged in water to try and keep it cool enough that it could calculate as, as fast as it was able to. Anyway, so just these really unique, exciting opportunities that um, uh, you know I think created a, a imaginative um, uh, creative, innovative, um, uh, fertile field that, uh, you know, allowed me to then eventually go on to MIT and pursue robotics really from, from the very beginning. And, um, you know, I, I started out in computer science and then I moved over to mechanical engineering and I really loved mechanical engineering because there I was able to do the electrical engineering classes, the mechanical engineering classes, the computer science classes, all of which, of course, are necessary for robotics. Um, uh, and I think that's one of the things I really love about robotics is it's sort of the culmination of all these different pieces, all these different types of engineering together to try and emulate human capabilities, um, uh, you know, which is sort of the, the ultimate in human engineering. Yeah, it, it is indeed a very fascinating field. And I'm wondering now, uh, as you're reflecting on it and you're, you're seeing these, uh, not just these debates rage, I guess, but also these very real improvements in, in parts of, of this value chain. So I'm thinking about right now, right, there's th this enormous excitement, again, around AI. So the, you know, the, the software component for now of, mm -hmm. of this uh, debacle. And, uh, and then a lot of people then are making quick leaps between uh, what they think is certain type of progress in AI and jump and put it straight into a robot. I, I want you to maybe just very quickly before we let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, where we are today, but very, very quickly, like you said, it's a robotics is many, many things. Yeah. Can you just line up what the main components are that need to work together in, in what you today call a robot? Yeah. So there's obviously <laughs> some physicality, or not obviously, but it, at least in the public imagination of a robot, there is physicality. Am I right? Yeah, all of these words are very squishy. And that's part of the challenge that we have, particularly when there are public debates about, 
you know, you remember a few years ago when there was talk about um, taxing robots. Well, what even is a robot? So to cover, you know, I think what would what most engineers would agree with, in my opinion, a robot has um, uh, the ability to interact with the physical environment. So it's got some physicality, as you said. Um, generally, that means it's got what we call actuators. Actuators are something that moves, whether that's a motor or a hydraulic cylinder or something that allows the robot to move something in the environment. So it's physical. Of course, to control that, you need electronics. So you have transistors, uh, uh, micro microcontrollers. Um, the robot needs to be able to sense the environment because typically what people will consider a robot is something that senses, computes, and then acts. So that sensor could be something like a camera. It could be a brake beam sensor. It could be an ultrasonic sensor. It could be a temperature sensor, right? Anything that it allows the robot to, to perceive, and I'm anthropomorphizing here, but to perceive the physical environment. And then there's the software component. And the software component is really the most uh, recent addition to the robot um, because mechanical robots have have existed for thousands of years. We used to call them, you know, all the way back to Greek times, they were called automatons, clockwork people or uh, clockwork mechanisms. So, so Trond, I uh, was walking around the farm here in uh, San Gregorio, California, uh, just uh, two days ago, and I found something really interesting. Hmm. And I don't know, most people listening is, aren't going to be able to see this, but um, this is uh, mostly made of brass. It's a clockwork mechanism. And, um, you know, most robots back in the day were robots, were, were devices that were made of a lot of gears, a lot of mechanical elements. They were generally had power source here. The power source is a spring. It's sort of this uh, spring steel piece. This is all brass, all these little gears and knobs and frames, all brass, except for the, the springs were steel. Um, brass doesn't work really good as a spring. Anyway, so these mechanical things were meant to accomplish something. And, um, you know, you can think of even a, a calculator or a mechanical cash register. Um, uh, many of your listeners won't remember, but I remember going to Thrifty's Drugs and they would ring us up on a mechanical cash register. You'd press the buttons and then you'd pull the lever to compute. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, in some sense, there is a, a, a much harder problem back then. Today, we can just write a few lines of software and we can calculate things. Back then, they had to like build these incredibly intricate, complicated mechanical computing devices. Mm -hmm. But if you take the mechanical, the sensors, the software, the electronics that make it all work and you put them together, then most people would say that's, you know, those are the ingredients that goes into creating what we might define as a robot. That's wonderful. I love that uh, clarification because I think there is right now, uh, not just confusion, but there's also, I guess, improvements in, you know, on the software side and people uh, there's even startups claiming, well, we're going to make software act in the world. There are some that say, well, we have software that acts in the world. Uh, what do you make of all that? Uh, because you you made a very clear distinction here. But then, I mean, just to take one issue, there's the concept of RPA, right? Maybe you can explain that. Why is robots used in that sense in this community? Yeah, well, so um, robotic process automation um, you know, is, is the concept of using technology to, um, to get work done more quickly. All right. It, it, it is about reducing our need as human beings to perform repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. And I think repetitive is, is often the key, uh, the key concept here. Mm -hmm. Robots historically, um, have been really great at doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and um, uh, the term, of course, then becomes sort of um, uh, 
misused perhaps, or, or the term broadens to, to mean lots of things. Like on a spreadsheet, you can create macros and those macros can do common tasks and that you, people call that robot, robotic process. Uh, uh, yeah, the reason I brought it up is, is not to, you know, I, I'll have people on and we can talk more uh, about RPA in a separate instance, but I bring it up because there's uh, AI, which we're going to talk about the, and the current moment in AI and then there is this assumption that because some aspects of kind of software AI are improving, that'll immediately lead to either exciting or perhaps even dangerous progress yeah. in terms of how robots, the, the robots you just described, the ones with the actuators, actually act in the world. And you have people like Elon Musk talking about, well, you know, at least a Tesla doesn't run after you. Uh, and which brings us into sort of uh, humanoid <laughs> robots or this idea yeah. that robots look a certain way. And obviously, you know, if they have two legs uh, and some very advanced robots today with two legs or leg-like, uh, you know, metal structures can actually run up uh, stairs to some to some degree. I yeah. want you to comment a little bit on, on, on that issue. I, I guess it starts to bring up a, a bunch of different things. But where are we today? with robotics yeah so um that is that is a really hard question to answer in the sense that um hollywood has done such a great job of you know stoking our imaginations to uh, both the wonder and potentially the terror of you know technology robotics uh, it is an interesting footnote that um back in the day if you looked at to japanese media uh movies, um, the robots were almost always the heroes. And if you looked at U.S. movies, robots were almost always the villains. And that kind of goes back to our cultural, you know, um, United Auto Workers, um, uh, fear of job loss and that type, type of thing. But, um, uh, you know, in some sense, we are in the same place we've always been. And this is one, one approach to say technology all the way back to the early days has been about um, creating convenience. Uh, it's been about reducing our need to spend time doing repetitive things. Uh, and um, that has led to prosperity. Prosperity has allowed us to diversify the type of activities we're able to engage in, which allows us to do more science and engineering, which creates more, more of this, right? So we're in this constant process of, improving the technology, um, being able to do more things than ever before. And it's, it's this exponential curve. If you've ever looked at sort of the, um, the history of technology, you notice this incredibly strong exponential curve where um, it, it, you know, takes a long time um, to, to really get going. But once it gets going, it like just skyrockets. And that's because, it, you need technology to create technology. You need um, knowledge to create knowledge. So um, the reason I say this is because, um, you know, this mechanism I'm showing you, this was considered AI back in the 18, you know, 70s uh, to 1960s, um, in a sense. These and I'm sure it was very impressive, right? Very yeah. impressive, right? Yeah, in, yeah. And the same fears existed, and that's the main point. The same fears existed that, that we were going to build mechanical devices that were going to exceed the capabilities of human beings, that it was going to create job loss. And then, of course, you had that, the, the people that were even scared of, you know, this idea of... <laughs> well, exactly. It's, it's, it's a coming physical. alive. <laughs> yeah, that's Yeah, great. but of the technology essentially becoming sentient and... And you know, turning on its masters, if you will. So um, let's before we run to this uh, sentience issue. I, I, it's great that you bring that up. That this fear has been there even with what we would today consider, you know, pretty pedestrian technology. Machine. That's yeah. th a machine, a mechanical concoction. So there was this moment. It now, a, a few years ago, in 2017, these Oxford uh, uh, authors, Frey and Osborne, predicted that 47% of jobs in the U.S. were of high risk to disappear through automation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever someone makes a prediction, I don't actually remember if they put a timeline on it, but they said, you know, sometime soon. 
uh, that hasn't happened. Right. And in fact, the MIT Work of the Future study just a few years ago found very few robots, surprisingly few robots mm -hmm. in U.S. manufacturing. Now, yeah. that's not to say that Frey and Osborne are wrong forever or that if MIT goes and looks for robots in a couple of years, they couldn't find more. But these predictions are at times a little exaggerated. What is mm -hmm. your thinking uh, around this whole job loss from robotics? Yeah, discussion? it's it's um, it's been a very interesting um, cycle that we've been in. Again, all the way back to the Industrial Revolution and the uh, um, you know the loom workers that predicted massive uh, job loss because of the mechanical loom. Um, and, and part of that has to go a slight tangent here. I want to show you something else I found on the farm. Can you see what that is? I don't know what it is, but it looks uh, old. Yes, very, very old. Oh, I see. It's a mortar. Yeah, yeah. It's a mortar, yes. Um, we found this, both of these things found uh, just doing some tractoring, preparing the soil for some planting. This was most likely a mortar created by the Ohlone people that uh, inhabited the San Francisco Peninsula. Um, I don't know how old this is. Um, and if anyone's an expert on these type of things, I'd love to get their opinion. But um, the, the interesting thing is you look back on all of human history and prehistory is that humans are great pattern matchers, right? Our brains evolved this ability to distinguish threats. Mm -hmm. And you could argue that that's almost the number one job of the brain. Identify a threat and flee or fight. Um, it turns out that most of the time, those threats were not grizzly bears. They were not um, uh, other things. They were our own species. Yeah. So the reason I make this point is because this is why we anthropomorphize, right? Anthropomorphize means ascribe human-like characteristics or behaviors to inanimate or, or animals or objects, you know, whatever. Um, and we do that because we're hardwired to look for threats. That's what humans do. We, we look for threats, and so our, our seeing these mechanical things, seeing these robots, seeing chat GPT that seems, you know, oddly human, we identify that as a potential threat. And it mm -hmm. kicks in this fear of protecting ourselves, right? We have to protect ourselves. And one of the ways that we have a lot of fear, of course, is we need to provide for our families. And if we don't have jobs, we can't provide for our families. And damn it, these robots are coming for our jobs. What are we going to do? The robots are the enemies. And at the end of the day, they're just tools, mechanical, electrical, software, otherwise. And, and their very nature really has not changed. They've gotten more complicated. They've gotten much, much more complicated mm -hmm. um, and more capable. But their very nature has not changed. They're a series of gears and dials and switches that automate processes um, that, uh, you know, used to take us a lot of time to do, and now they don't take us as much time. So now we can focus on art and science and technology and medicine and all these things. Um, but job loss has not been an issue simply because we create jobs faster than they, than they change. And just one example of this is just a you know, not too long ago, social media didn't exist. Well, if you look at the type of jobs people have right now, I can't remember what the statistic was, but some massive amount of, of jobs are now social media related. It used to be in the early 1920s that 70% of all people worked in agriculture to produce the food we needed to survive as a species. Now that number is less than 2% or 2.5%. So there is this job evolution, right, which I think most people would agree is a good thing. Um, back in the 50s, there was something called a telephone operator, and there were tens of thousands of them, not hundreds. I don't know what the number is. We don't have many telephone operators anymore because somebody invented the automatic switchboard based on a, you know, uh, uh, automatic switching circuit. No one is bemoaning the loss of the telephone operator job anymore. And typically what happens is that people in those jobs retire 
and their children take jobs that are, you know, modern that are mm-hmm. created in the new economy. So, so I can um, I can accept that point, right? That there there is a switch over of tasks, and you know, even if some jobs disappear, you know, there's new task content even in the same jobs. So there's certainly a not, lot of new professions, and and certainly a lot of new tasks within the same jobs. Um, but some of these fears are, I guess, persisting, and I'm wondering about this idea of of the humanoid robots there there seems mm-hmm. to be a little bit debate yeah. within the robotic community should we keep making robots that pretend to look more and more like humans and i guess this also goes for software should we you know make software that talks and acts and you know sounds like humans or should we actually make it so somewhat distinct so that Mm-hmm. It's very clear that it isn't a human. Yeah. What is your view there? Because there's effective AI, there's this whole movement, you know, if only, uh, you know, and in Stanford we have human, uh, you know, this whole uh, idea that human-oriented AI is a, is, a, is a good thing and we have to imbue these uh, robots and AIs with human values. That's yeah. kind of one direction. And others are saying, no, wait a second, uh, computers will never be that so let them be different and let it be very very clear what is your view there yeah you know i guess in that formulation i would be a little bit more on the the latter side of things i think that um, there is a fundamental difference between technology machines and humans and and i think it does a disservice to the general public when we anthropomorphize the technology to the point that it creates these fears Right. Let me let me read you some some headlines. Man killed by robot that confused him for a box of vegetables. Robot <laughs> crushes man to death by by mistaking him for a box uh, for for a food box in South Korea. Right. And the reason that this is problematic is because we're saying that the robot was confused. Right. No, the robot wasn't confused. The robot was following its programming. Right. It had a set it, it, of instructions that it right. was following. And in industrial robotics for ages, right, uh, there was even regulation. Robots had to be in cages. Now, some of those regulations are laxed a little bit for these cobots, which right. uh, you know have certain sensors that presumably can, when they work, yeah. uh, figure that out. And this wasn't one of those, incidentally, but... Um, yeah. So I wanted to point out, so the International Labor Organization estimates that there are 6,000 deaths every day worldwide related to industrial accidents or, you know, somehow from somebody's job. So yeah. why was this particular death, you know, may he rest in peace, such so newsworthy? It was because of this fear of robotics, right? We were anthropomorphizing. And, and on the extreme side, you had people saying, you know, the AI is now starting to lash back. You know, it saw an opportunity and it, it killed this man because maybe this man mistreated it or something. You know, who knows? I think that calling it artificial intelligence is actually uh, somewhat problematic. Um, mm-hmm. Not as scientists, right? And, and when the, you know, sort of when the formal study of AI was was launched back in the 50s um, uh, at a university, and I can't remember which one right now. And you mean well, the Dartmouth, Dartmouth yes. meeting? Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's great, right? These are things we should be studying and we should be exploring. Um, I think that there's great value in that. But we do need to be careful in how these things are presented to the public at large because most of the time, my experience, most of the time, the people who are most afraid of AI are the people who least understand it. Hmm. And the people who are often predicting you know, the calamitous outcomes are the people who don't don't necessarily have a full appreciation for what the technology is. Um, but let's so chat, chat a little bit about this current moment where I guess what's somewhat different is that at least some experts are now, whether they truly are worried yeah. is another question, but that they are at least question. expressing some worry and yeah. they are expressing that there is this urgent need to regulate AI and I think perhaps robotics hasn't really been super mm-hmm. prevalent in this discussion. But you know, if this yeah, continues yeah, this way, it yeah, it, it was before, and it will be again once people realize. Wait a second, you put AI inside of you know yeah. a, a robot, and now we're really scared. 
What, what do you make of this? Are the experts, are there uh, experts that you trust that are legitimately scared or are they expressing a different thing or are they just saying this for a different reason? You know, it's really hard to know, Tron, and I think it's some mix of all of the above. Certainly there are experts that, um, I mean, we should always be thoughtful. When, when you know, I mentioned um, uh, going to Lawrence Livermore National Lab, one of the things that I did when I was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab back in the uh, in the late eighties was I got to meet Edward Teller. Mm-hmm. Edward Teller is the father of the hydrogen bomb or, or, you know, acknowledged by many as the father of the hydrogen bomb. And, and I had this discussion with him at the time and I'm a high school student. All right. And this is Edward Teller. So, um, but it had a huge impact on me because at the end of the day, what it made me realize is that as engineers and scientists, we have a responsibility to be thoughtful about the things that we do. The, if you look at the history of humanity, the society that we live in today exists because of engineers, right? And you could argue that this politicians and, you know, philosophers and, you know, artists have had a big impact. And yes, that's true. But by and large, the world that we live in was created by engineers. Oftentimes engineers are good soldiers doing what they're told Versus really being thoughtful about, you know, the impact that what we, you know, the the impact of the things that we build may have on society in the future. So I applaud any scientist or engineer that is willing to stop and say, hey, let's take a step back. Let's see what what, what is it that we're doing? What are the possible impacts? And is it a good or bad thing for society? Mm -hmm. Um, So I would never discourage anyone from doing that. Um, I do believe that much like the jobs issue of decade past, we're, we're going to see the same cycle again, which is overblown fears, a little bit of hysteria and panic, and it's not going to turn out to, um, you know, be the end of the human race. Um, so, so there's a, then let's talk specifics about this, uh, AI in robotics right now, what kind of AI is involved in the robots that you have built? And yeah. what kind of AI will be involved in the robots that you and others build in the next five to 10 years? Just to take a time frame that, you know, we're, we're going to be around, hopefully. And, uh, you know, ma- many of us will, will, will see that next decade. Yeah, it's a great question. I love that. So um, one of my companies, Vecna Robotics, we build driverless forklifts. Um, so we, we take a, a standard industrial forklift and we make it so that it doesn't need to have a human operator on it all the time. Um, One of the things that's really important to note is that a forklift is a dangerous piece of equipment Mm -hmm. and it can cause damage. It can hurt people. So um, the AI that we put on the robots right now, and I'm air quoting AI are things that are what I would call discriminatory AI. Mm -hmm. Discriminatory AI is I give an algorithm, a picture, and that algorithm can help me identify where the pallet is, right? So our forklifts pick up pallets. It can help me identify where the pallet is in that picture. And um, that can be very useful because what you find is that, um, you know, in a warehouse setting, the pallets aren't always where they're supposed to be. And so we were able to create these algorithms that allowed, allowed the system to be more robust, more resilient by using deep learning, um, you know, type of algorithms to, identify where that pallet is and and be able to do a better job of picking it up. What we would never trust the AI to do is to drive the forklift, Hmm. right? Because um, this is something that you have to be able to prove safety on. You have to be able to show um, what's to what's called a performance level D, um, you know, the sort of aircraft level safety that the robot isn't going to hurt somebody. Um, AI isn't good at that kind of stuff, right? AI is kind of, kind of what I would call more fuzzy logic. There was this thing called fuzzy logic a few decades ago that everyone got really excited about. I actually think it describes AI better than it described what it, what it was about. Um, AI is good for things that are kind of squishy, right? Um, now, um, machine vision is a really great example of that. Well, now they've got generative AI that can not only try and, um, you know, identify items in an image, but can actually create an image. 
but this image is fake. Um, and, uh, you know, doesn't mean it's not useful. There's a lot of really great things you can do with artificially generated images. But for us, um, you know, the, the AI that is useful for getting work done, our type of work in a, in a warehouse or factory is, is pretty limited. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you think autonomous mobility generally is going to take uh, quite a while? Yeah. Um, you know, there were a number of uh, autonomy companies, um, a couple of different forklift companies specifically, that they took the approach of we're going to build our entire autonomy on AI. Mm -hmm. Basically, instead of programming it, we're going to teach it. We're going to build sort of a, you know, this deep learning neural network mm -hmm. and we're going to train it to drive the forklift rather than program the forklift. And these efforts have all failed. Yeah. Everybody has gone back and the self-driving car companies, many, you know, much the same thing. They've gone back to what I would call more deterministic algorithms. Mm -hmm. Um Now, will there be a time when, you know, we're able to, when we've got the computing power to, and, and simulation is good enough to like test these AI algorithms to the, you know, nth degree and have some confidence that they're safe? Yeah, that will probably eventually happen. And we'll probably be on this path of moving away from people touching keyboards to create algorithms more to describing what we want, training the algorithms, et cetera. But we're, we're, we're a ways away from that still. Mm -hmm. How far away? I don't know. Decade, couple decades. Um, and, and it's all just a spectrum. So, you know, there are really no hard lines here. But that's really sort of the breakdown of it. Um, uh, AI is a tool. That tool is useful in certain areas. Um, typically, when there's hype and fear, we tend to over- um, uh, over, uh, apply certain things, you know, back in the day when it was fuzzy logic, fuzzy logic was going to solve everything. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we find that that's not the case. So what, what in particular have you been able to use generative AI for? I'm sure like the next guy you've been experimenting with it, like you, I don't know, tried it out as an alternative to your search engine or something, or, yeah. you know, put it on a, on a screen aside there and like, like me, you know, tested it out for your work, for yeah, simple yeah. things. Uh, what, if anything, of substance have you been able to use it for? Um, you know, I don't know that I've got a great answer for that. It's a lot of fun. Um, I play around with it. Um, uh, you know, generating images, um, uh, generating text. Um, but, you know, I think the important thing here for people to realize in generative AI Uh, I want to share a quote from George Box. So George Box was a British statistician. Uh, and in 1976, he says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. All models are wrong, but some are useful. This quote changed my life, Trond. I'd say more than anything else in my life, this quote changed my life. Because what it made me realize is that our perception of reality is a model. Everything we think is a model. And it's wrong. You have to accept the fact that it's wrong. It is imperfect. It does not comprehend or, or encapsulate the full richness of reality. But it can be useful. No, right? I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. But I want to challenge you on one thing. So I typically take, I guess, the skeptical attitude too. I mean, I even wrote a whole PhD back in the early internet days when everyone was super excited about how the internet was supposedly going to change the entire world of the workplace. And mm -hmm. I kind of basically proved that that's very unlikely to happen or it'll take an enormous amount of time. And yes, it took 20 years before anybody dared to, to truly introduce the virtual workplace. And let's see yeah. now some of us are, are going back and it's uh, at least a hybrid situation. At least you want, yeah. if you want promotions and such, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, there is something, I think, afoot. Like the, these changes aren't just nothing. No, so, for sure. So, so something is happening. For example, I think a lot of us assume that robotics or even AI Yes, it could have some effects on repetitive tasks, which we started with in this interview. But when it comes to me, you know, smart person, 
nothing's going to change. Oh, and guess well, what? Yeah, I don't yeah. think that that is true. So whatever we were true. thinking or whoever amongst us was thinking, nothing is going to change. That doesn't even, that's not even true for how our work has changed over the last 10, 15 years because email did change a few things, right? So all mm-hmm. these technologies, they change something. They just don't change everything. Can you maybe expand on that a little bit from, from your point of view? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And And most of what I reject is the fear. Things are changing. And um, I think that, uh, you know, the the ability to do more. I mean, the fact that I can, you know, let me give you just one stupid example. I used to be late for every flight. Why was I late for every flight? Because I didn't want to waste time sitting in the airport. Mm -hmm. I had important things to do. Yeah. So I would try and optimize my time, you know, and I would leave the office at the last possible minute to get to the airport. So I'm wasting as little time as possible. Today, I'm an hour early to the airport. Why? Because now the airport is my mobile office and mm-hmm. I can be as productive in the airport, right? So like these tools, they are amazing. They have totally changed our ability to be productive, to be connected, to learn, to have access to knowledge. I actually did this TEDx talk uh, many years ago about, you know, how we're superheroes, like every single one of us with, with this cell phone device or the internet, we're like the equivalent of superheroes of, you know, a couple decades ago. Um, so no, things are changing. Um, I, I guess I prefer to be optimistic and proactive about taking that and using it for good rather than, fearing and regulating, right? The problem at the end of the day with anthropomorphizing this technology is that we miss who's culpable when things go wrong, Mm -hmm. right? Not one of those headlines talked about, you know, the programmer who maybe didn't, um, you know, create a safe system that then ultimately killed this human being, right? They all anthropomorphized the robot. In some cases, even the robot arm one of the articles said the robot arm confused the human for a box of vegetables. Um, this is the great mistake is that when we start to blame the technology versus the people who are creating it or controlling it, it can be, it, it can be disastrous really. So I'd say that's the fear I have is humans misusing technology to, to, you know, do things that we shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. The technology itself is a great thing. Um, It allows us to help people better than we've ever been able to help people before. It allows us to create uh, opportunities and, and, and um, access to capital and um, uh, freedom from human rights abuses um, unprecedented in the history of the human race. So I think these changes are good. I, for one, embrace and love the technology to get better and better and better. The question at the end of the day is, who's controlling it and what are we going to use it for? Are we ultimately going to use it to benefit all people? Or are we going to allow it to be abused for the benefit of the few? And um, this is why I think it's really important that our heroes are... are, um, our role models need to focus on good, kind, uh, um, uh, you know, taking care of each other, helping each other, not on greed, not on, you know, um, ego. Uh, these things cause problems. These things cause, cause wars and famines and, and genocides. Um, so I'd say that's really my perspective here is bring on the technology. And I think we should explore humanoid robots. I think we should explore human-like AI. Um, but we need to understand that they're machines, they're algorithms. It's, it's again, no, no different than this. It's more complicated, right? There's more gears and they're smaller and they're actually electrons and little switches, but it's the exact same thing. And this can be an amazing tool to help human beings take better care of each other than ever before in the history of uh, humanity. Um, But fear and misunderstanding, those are, those are contrary to what we want to be doing. Mm. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, things are going to change and they're going to change. They're going to change faster and faster and faster. And we're going to have to get better as a society at dealing with change. Um, but again, I don't think fear is, is going to help us there. No, I guess this for me just brings us back a, a little full circle. I'm, I'm working on, on this uh, AI governance issue right now. Is there a final advice you have to people who uh, are, want to strike a balance there? Maybe they're yeah. uh, in government or maybe they're advising uh, on, on all of these fears and they, they want to s- do something or say something or be a productive voice in, in this debacle because I guess sitting back 100% and just letting things happen may not necessarily be the right thing either from what you're saying, because there are people who focus on greed. There will be companies who double down on creating something and may not be thinking about what what they're actually creating. So what is then your advice on on sort of governance of, of, let's call it robotics with AI? Yeah. How would you do it? I would say that the focus must be on accountability. Right. The focus should not be on limiting the type of research or on, on, you know, trying to create some kind of governance around the technology itself. The focus should be on accountability for people who create technology. And I think that is a critical differentiation because most of what I've seen are people calling for a halt to AI research because they're fearful that the AI is going to overthrow humanity. Mm -hmm. And excuse my French, but that's bullshit, Mm -hmm. right? What's going to happen is that we need to figure out mechanisms to, to hold people accountable. However, the problem with most regulation is that it benefits the big and punishes the small. Um, yeah. almost, almost without exception, right? The small players lose out like a, let's just talk about farming for one second. There are all these regulations. And as a small farm here in Rancho San Gregorio, there's no way I can be a profitable farm because dealing with all these regulations and all of this overhead makes it impossible to be profitable unless you have some big scale that's big enough to, you know, to, to come out ahead. So that's the problem with regulation in many ways is that it creates an unfair playing field. It keeps power in the hands of people who have power and it keeps the small people down. So those, those are the things that I would be very careful about. Um, you know, if, if regulation on AI makes it so that only companies like Microsoft and Google can actually afford to participate, then we're going to have a problem. Yeah. All right. Looks to me that we uh, would need to continue this discussion. Maybe if I make my way all the way to San Gregorio over the mountains on my on my bike, uh, you know, on this mechanical structure, we can uh, have a yeah. coffee or some beverage and discuss this more. You're absolutely welcome to come. It is beautiful here. One of the things I like about it is uh, we're right here, sort of in in uh, adjacent to Silicon Valley, but we're also a million miles away. And it's always a good reminder when I'm sitting down in the Redwood Grove, looking up at, you know, the tallest living organisms that uh, this planet has produced, that um, uh, the world is an amazing, wonderful place. And, um, you know, we should use technology to to enhance that and make that something that everybody can participate in. And um, and uh, it's a good thing at the end of the day. So, Let's yeah, I look forward to your visit. Let's do that. All right. Thank you so much. Take care, Tron. Great talking to you. You have just listened to another episode of the Futurized podcast with me, Trond Arne Unheim, futurist, scholar, and author. If you are interested in my products or services, feel free to check out futurized.org slash store, where you can book a keynote speech, become a sponsor or partner, request a podcast swap, or buy a few of my books, such as Augmented Lean, Health Tech, Future Tech, Pandemic Aftermath, Disruption Games, or Leadership From Below. If you're interested in any or all of my projects, check out my website, trondundheim.com, which has links to other podcasts as well as my public appearances. Thank you. Please share this show with those you care about. To find us on social media is easy. We are Futurized on LinkedIn and YouTube and Futurized 2 on Instagram and Twitter. See you next time. Futurized, conversations that matter.